Would you turn back to Ephesians chapter 5? I've entitled this message, As Becometh Saints. Look in verse 3 once again. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as becometh saints. All sexual sin is under the word fornication. All uncleanness or impurity. All covetousness should not be committed and is unbecoming and inappropriate for one who is a saint. Amen. John said, These things I write unto you that you sin not. Sin is not becoming. Sin is not acceptable to any saint. He groans under the burden of it every day. But it's not acceptable. There isn't any saint of God who says salvation is by grace, therefore I'm not worried about not committing sin. I can sin all I want and more than I want because everything is covered by grace. Everything is covered by grace. But no believer has that attitude towards sin. Look in verse 4. Neither filthiness, obscenity, nor foolish talking, nor jesting, which are not convenient, which are not appropriate, which are not becoming, but rather giving of thanks. Now here is what is appropriate for a believer, the giving of thanks. In everything, Paul said in 1 Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians 5.18, in everything, give thanks. Doesn't matter what it is. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Whatever happened to you today is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. In everything give thanks. Now he mentions these three sins again in verse 5. For this ye know that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater, hath any inheritance in the kingdom of God and of Christ. Now, there's not anybody in this room that does not struggle with sexual sin. I think that's pointed out right after the fall when they knew they were naked. They were naked beforehand but it wasn't an issue. But now they have fallen sinful natures. But does that mean you go ahead and give in a life of debauchery? No. No. If you do, you're not a believer. Now, it is that simple. If you do, you don't have the Spirit of God. Doesn't mean you don't continually struggle with it. But does that mean you give in to it? Hey, salvation's by grace. I don't need to worry about it. There's not anybody in this room that doesn't struggle with uncleanness. And that means impurity, impure thoughts, impure motives. You fight with that every day, don't you? Fight with it every day. But do you say, well, if I think it, I might as well do it. Doesn't make any difference. No, there is a struggle with sin. Is there anybody in this room that is free of covetousness? You never think, well, I wish I had my neighbors fill in the blank. I wish I had more of this. I wish I had more of that. There's not anybody in this room that is free from covetousness. As a matter of fact, all i got to do is say is don't covet, and you'll start coveting. Yeah. 
That's all it takes. Don't covet this. What are you going to do? You're going to covet it. You see, you've got a fallen, sinful nature. And to deal with this passage of Scripture and not recognize that is not to deal with this passage of Scripture, honestly. Now, everybody constantly deals with a sinful nature. Everybody that's a believer. An unbeliever doesn't. He doesn't know what sin is. He is clueless with regard to what Paul meant in Romans chapter 7 when he said, Oh, wretched man that I am. An unbeliever can't enter into this. It's only the believer who can. But a man who, or woman who gives themselves to the pursuit of this sin, these sins, I'm sure you could add other ones to it as well, but these are the three he mentions, does not have the Spirit of God. They've never been born again. I hope I can explain that. Look, verse 6. Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things, because of fornication, because of uncleanness, because of covetousness, those are the three things he mentions. Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things the wrath of God cometh upon the children of disobedience. Now, the wrath of God is a part of who he is. He's holy. It's not a bad thing. We think of it in that light, but it's not a bad thing. It's a glorious thing. It's because of who he is. He's holy. He's just. He's going to punish sins. Now, Paul says, don't let anybody deceive you with vain words. Don't think God is indifferent toward this sexual sin or impurity or covetousness or greediness. The wrath of God comes on the children of disobedience because of this or the children of unbelief. But you know, it won't come on children's faith. It just flat out won't come on the children of faith. While they live with these things and groan under the burden of them. O wretched man that I am, they do not live in these things. They live with these things. You know that so. You live with these things. O oh, wretched man that I am, what I hate to do, what I want to do, I don't do. And really, the language of Romans chapter 7 is the language of a healthy believer. Somebody talks about this, well, that's Paul before he's saved. You're not saved if you believe something like that. You don't even know what sin is. This is Paul expressing himself the wretchedness of sin because he has a holy nature, a new nature. A believer lives with these things, but he doesn't live in them. Now, what do I mean by that? You go ahead and say, what's the use? I'm going to give myself to the pursuit of these things. Here's the situation. Here's the truth. Sin in any way is never acceptable. It's never okay to a believer. You're always aware of it. It's always there with you. You hate it. But you never just say, it's okay. He says in verse 7, Be not ye therefore partakers with them. What he's saying there is don't act like an unbeliever. Don't conduct yourself like someone who doesn't know Christ. Now, 1 Corinthians 4, 7 says, Who maketh thee to differ from another? But the fact of the matter is, you do differ. If you're a believer, you do differ. And you know who has made you to differ. God the Father in eternal election, God the Son in His redeeming work on the cross, and God the Holy Spirit in giving you a new nature that was not there before. You do differ. You differ infinitely from an unbeliever. And you know who made you to differ. Now let's go back to verse 3. Fornication. I remember one time someone left uh, 13th Street. They were upset. And um, they had fallen into some kind of, uh, 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 under this branch of sin. And they were blaming 
Brother Mahan, they said, he didn't teach us against this. And I thought, good grief. Everybody in here knows that's wrong, but we need to be taught to live. You already know how to live. Everybody knows this is wrong. He didn't teach us against this. No, you did what you wanted to do. Um, all uncleanness, and impurity, or covetousness, desiring your neighbor's wife, manservant, maidservant, ox, ass, whatever's your neighbor's. I wish I had that. I'm not content. Let it not be once be named among you as becometh saints. Now these actions are completely inappropriate for those who are saints. And every saint would agree. The word saint means holy one. Sanctified one. Holy one. The word Christian is found three times in the Bible. The word believer is found two times. They're both very good words, aren't they? I mean, even anything that's in the Bible is good. Sometimes I might want to hesitate to use the word Christian because of the way it's abused, but it's a good scriptural word. They were first called Christians by way of derision at Antioch. You can read about that in Acts chapter 11. It's a good word. A believer is a good... We believe. We believe the gospel. But do you know the word saint is found over 100 times? So that gives you some idea of the importance of this word. Saint. Holy one. It's a good scriptural word. And it is the word that is most often used to describe that very special group, the brethren. The brethren. I'm looking at some saints of God. Some holy ones of God. And this is the name really that is most appropriate to use with regard to a believer. A saint. Now, a saint is one who is of the brethren. Of the same father. Born of the same spirit. I love the scripture in Romans chapter 8. For whom he did foreknow them he also did predestinate to be the con first to be conformed to his image. That he might be the firstborn among many brethren. That's who these saints are. They're the brethren. By this shall all men know you're my disciples. By your love to the brethren. Your love to one another. Now. Every believer is a saint. I know that the Catholic Church has made it a saint as somebody who has excess surplus good works and they're just so good and they've become so holy that they can even share some of their good works with you because they're already over the top and have excess. Now, that's foolishness, you know that. Every believer is a saint. Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 2. Verse 11, for both he that sanctifieth, now that could be speaking of the Father, that could be speaking of the Spirit, and it would be accurate, but it's speaking of the Son. We're going to see how all three persons of the Godhead are in this thing of sanctifying the believer. For both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one. Now, if you're sanctified, you know what that means? That means you're one with the Lord Jesus Christ. That means you can't be separated from him. It doesn't mean you're close. It means you're one. And the Lord gives the best illustration of this as the, of the vine and the branches. The same stem that's going through the vine goes through the branches. And there's no connecting point. Now, do I understand that? Of course not. Do I believe it? With all my heart, every believer is vitally, eternally united to the Lord Jesus Christ. Always have been, always will be. Never a time when this began to be. I've never been separated from Jesus Christ. Now, 
The Father sanctified me in eternal election. The Spirit sanctified me in regeneration. The Son sanctified me on the cross. Now, in this thing of Christ dying on the cross, it says, by one offering, by his death, he hath perfected forever them that are, what? Sanctified. Sanctified. That's the word that most comprehensively describes God's salvation, sanctification. You know, uh, religion always uses, they, 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 talk, they, they talk about, well, justification is your legal standing before God, and sanctification is how holy you are. That's a complete denial of what sanctification is. Sanctification is the whole work of God in salvation. Sanctified by the Father to be holy in election, sanctified by the Son on the cross in redemption, sanctified by God the Holy Spirit, given a new nature, a holy nature in regeneration or in the new birth. Now sanctification means to take something common and ordinary and set it apart for holy purposes. Isn't that what happened to you? The first time the word's used is with reference to the seventh day. The six days that God created the universe, the seventh day he set apart. Now the seventh day wasn't any more special than the first six days, but because God set it apart, it was. You see, when God does something, he does it. And it's the day of rest. The day of rest. Salvation is resting in the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen to this scripture from Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 5. Before, and this is true of every believer, before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. Before thou camest out of the womb, I sanctified thee. Every believer... Now, this thing of saints, we've got to understand this before we can understand what, what Paul is saying, this thing of being a saint. Every saint was chosen by God before time began to be holy. According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him. Every believer was sanctified by the Lord Jesus Christ when he died for them on Calvary's tree and God declared them to be holy. Declared holy. Declared by God holy. Not, not me, I'm holy now. No, this is God's declaration by virtue of what the Lord Jesus Christ did. Every believer, because of the blood of his cross, every believer is holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in his sight. Made holy by the Spirit of God. Turn with me to John chapter 1. I'm going to read several scriptures there because I'm, uh, uh, this, this holiness that a believer has, it's because they've been birthed of God. Can God give birth to something that's sinful? He's holy. How could he give birth to something that can sin? Okay, John chapter 1, verse 12. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God even to them that believe on his name, which were born, which were birthed, not of blood. You're not saved because your mom and dad are. Nor of the will of the flesh. Not because a bunch of men got together and said, we're going to pray for you till you're saved. Nor the will of man. There's no such thing as free will, but of God. Look in John chapter 3. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest, except God be with him. 
Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, born above, he cannot see the kingdom of God. He said, Nicodemus, you don't know anything. You don't know anything. You say, we know that a man, can... no, you don't know anything. Except a man be born from above, birthed by the Spirit of God, he can't enter the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, how can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter into the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit. Now, that's not, not talking about water baptism. Um, you're not born again because you dumped into the water and come back out. Uh, the, Paul speaks in Ephesians 5, the washing of water by the Word. You see, there's no new birth apart from the Word of God. You don't just, I've been born again. No, you hear the Word, and, it's, and we're going to see that a little bit more in just a minute, but let me go on reading. That, verse 6, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. And that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. That which is born of the flesh can never rise above the flesh. It can never be anything but sinful. And that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I say unto you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it listeth. Thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh. And whether it goeth, so is every one that is born of the Spirit. James 1, 18, let me just quote this to you. Of his own will begat he us with the word of truth. Now, I want you to look at these in Peter. Turn to 1 Peter. Chapter 1, verse 2. Or verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to His abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a living hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Look in the same chapter, verse 22. Seeing you've purified your souls and obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that you love one another with a pure heart, fervently being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God which liveth and abideth forever. And here is that incorruptible seed. It's in this message. All flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man is the flower of grass. The grass withers, the flower thereof falls away, but the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. Look in chapter 3. Verse 4, but let it be the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. Did you notice that not corruptible? Not even subject to corruption. Look in First John chapter 3. Whosoever is born of God doth, verse 9, First John chapter 3, verse 9. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. For his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he's born of God. Now what's that a reference to? That's the new nature. Somebody says, well, that means a child of God can't practice sin. Do you practice sin? Sure you do. Do you do it more than once? That's the practice of it, isn't it? Uh, this is talking about the new nature that... And the, the scripture, it says it doth not commit sin for his seed. The seed of God remains in him. He cannot sin. He lacks the ability to sin because he's born of God. This is what this is a reference to. Look in 1 John chapter 5, verse 18. We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not. But he that's begotten of God keepeth himself, and the wicked one toucheth him not. Now, do you know with regard to your new nature, Satan doesn't have anything to work with. Now, he's got plenty to work with in the old nature. But he can't touch your new nature. Remember the way the Lord says the
prince of this world has come and found nothing in me. Well, that's true with regard to everyone that's a partaker of the divine nature. Now, so we see what a saint is. A saint is someone who God elected before time began to be holy. He set him apart for that purpose. A saint is someone who Christ declared to be holy by his work on the cross, by putting away their sins. So you don't have any sin. You stand without fault, without blame before God. And you've been given a holy nature. It's called the sanctification of the Spirit in the new birth, where you've been given a new birth. And that's what believes. Your old nature never believes. I love what that man, that man cried out in Mark chapter 9. He said, Lord, I believe. Help thou mine unbelief. Your old nature never believes. Your new nature always believes. Partakers of the divine nature. Now, how inappropriate, how unbecoming, how ugly is sin in a saint of God. It's ugly, isn't it? Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, a saint and still painfully aware of being a sinner. Every saint and only the saints are painfully aware of being a sinner, a Romans 7 sinner. Now let's turn over there for just a moment. Romans chapter 7. Paul is speaking as a believer here, for he says, For we know that the law is spiritual, but I'm carnal, sold under sin. Sold as a slave to sin is what that means. Somebody says, he couldn't have been saved to make a statement like that. No, when he wasn't saved, he said, touching the righteousness which is in the law, I was blameless. But now that the Lord has saved him and revealed himself to him, he speaks differently, doesn't he? For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For that which I do, I allow not. I don't approve of that. I don't say that's acceptable. For what I would, be perfectly obedient, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it's good. Now then, it's no more I that do it, but the sin that dwelleth in me, that old man. For I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. You know that. For to will is present with me. But how to perform that which is good, sometimes I mess up. That's what we said, is it? He said, I find not. For the good that I would, I do not. But the evil which I would not. That I do. Now, if I do that which I would not, it's no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find in a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man, but I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. Now, 1 John chapter 2. My little children, verse 1. These things write I unto you that you sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Now this is very important. He's no corrupt lawyer. He's Jesus Christ the righteous. Everything about his gospel is altogether righteous. 
And Him forgiving you of your sin, it's a righteous thing for Him to do. Because your sin was put away. And it is no more. And you stand before God without guilt. This is the lawyer who makes you plead guilty and causes you to be utterly justified. There's no lawyer like this lawyer, is there? He's Jesus Christ, the righteous. Now, sin is never becoming or acceptable or okay in any saint. And it's actually worse in a believer than it is in an unbeliever, isn't it? We've sinned against love, against light. Lord, give me grace to not sin against you. Lord, give me grace to see that all that I do is sin. Lord, give me the grace to see that in thy son I have no sin. And those are three things I want to see. I don't want to sin against him. I want to know that all I do is sin. And I want to know that I have no sin. <laughs> you know, an unbeliever would listen to that and say, you're crazy. <laughs> so what? So what? I guess, you know. I want to close with Romans chapter 5. Verse 20. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. If you ever see God's holy law and see anything but sin in yourself, you've never seen the law. You don't really know what it means. If you see God's holy law, the Ten Commandments, if you see it, you're going to be a place where sin abounds, where it overflows, where it erupts, and that's all there is. If you ever see the law, and if you can look at God's law and think, well, I've been measured up there, you just never seen it. You just never seen it. But, where sin abounded, everywhere sin abounded, grace did much more abound, that as sin hath reigned unto death. Now, what's that mean? How much choice do you have in this thing of not dying? What can you do to prevent death? I don't care how he healthy you live. I don't care how clean you live. You're going to die pretty soon. You know why? Because you're a sinner. And there's nothing you can do to prevent that. That's the reign of sin unto death. Because you're a sinner, you've got no choice in this thing. You are going to die. <clears throat> That as sin hath reigned to death, even so might grace reign. You see, if God gives you his grace, it reigns in that you're going to be saved. And there's nothing you can do to mess that up. Isn't that wonderful? There's nothing you can do to prevent God's salvation. You can't send it away. You can't prevent it from happening. Just as you can't prevent death, if God gives you his grace... You can't prevent his salvation. But look at this word next. Even so might his grace reign through righteousness. It's righteous grace. It's a grace that honors the righteousness of God. There's nothing corrupt. There's nothing unclean about it. It's holy and glorious. <clears throat> Unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, I read a passage of Scripture like that, 
And let not that once be named among you as become a saint. And I'm aware of me being all three of those things. That does not in any way give us a reason to go ahead and say, well, might as well do it. Might as well go ahead and live a debauched life. What difference does it make? If I think it, I might as well do it. No, no, no. No sin ought to be even once named among me and you as becometh saints. But thank God when you do, when you do sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he's the propitiation. He's the sin-removing sacrifice for our sins, not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world, Jew and Gentile, black and white, bond and free. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for making us saints. We confess our sin. We pray for forgiveness and cleansing. And Lord, we ask that you would cause your word to be hid in our heart that we might not sin against thee. We ask that you would cause us to know that we're nothing but sin and we can look to nowhere but Christ. And Lord, cause us to understand that in thy Son we have no sin, that we're holy and unblameable and unreprovable in your sight. Lord, thank you for making us saints. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Matt, come lead us in